You know, brethren, it seems that one of the local news stations was interviewing a 95-year-old lady because she just got married for the fourth time. The interviewer asked her questions about her life and about what it felt like to be marrying again at 95, and then about her husband and his occupation. She said, well, he's a funeral director. He kind of looked up at her and he, interesting, the newsman thought, and then he uh, asked if she wouldn't mind telling him just a little bit about her first three husbands and what they did for a living. She paused for a few moments, needing a couple of minutes to reflect on all those years, and after a short time, a big smile came on her face, and she answered proudly, explaining that she first married a banker. That was when she was in her early 20s. And then after that, a circus ringmaster when she was in her 40s. Later on, a preacher when she was in her 60s. And now in her 90s, a funeral director. Well, the interviewer looked at her really quite astonished and he was thinking to himself, let's see, a banker, a circus ringmaster, a preacher, in a funeral director, and he wondered about it, and he asked why she had married four men with such diverse occupations and careers. And she smiled and explained, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> you know, you younger ones may not know that, but when I was a kid, that was a big saying. <laughs> anyway. We'll move on to what this is about today. And I'm going to title this sermon, Behold the Master's Cup. We'll start out, I would like to ask you a question. How would you like to be an, let's say, old-fashioned cupbearer to a king? Well, perhaps you are. In a short time, we'll be drinking a small portion of red wine at Passover. At Jesus' last Passover service, he refers to it as drinking from his cup. Now, what does that mean? Now, in days gone by, <clears throat> monarchs feared that some of those around them would poison their drinks. So they employed the services of what was called a cupbearer to sample the drink first. If it was poison, he died, sparing the king's life. If it was safe, he got to share in that really royal refreshment, and he remained in the king's presence and shared in basically all of the things that the king did, and he had the king's confidence. I'll give you an example of that. It would be in Genesis 4, verse 21, and it'd be talking, and when he, as referring to Pharaoh, restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, he gave the cup, the, but the uh, chief butler gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. So that was the way that it was originally established. So in the book of, G of Genesis, Pharaoh's Chief Butler was actually the cupbearer. That's what he was. He's very influential position. And later brother Nehemiah had that role as cupbearer to the king of Persia. You can find that in Nehemiah 1 verse 11. So a cupbearer was frequently in the presence of the king, participating and involved in whatever that king did. It was quite a job. Now the phrase drinking of the cup eventually symbolized sharing the consequences of what was in that cup. It also came to mean accepting what the king dealt out. The whole world drinks of Babylon's cup full of wine, 
of her fornications and abominations. We'll go through four scriptures here. It'll be, if you want to just mark it down, I'll be going through Revelation 7, 4 and 18, 3. at this particular point, and um, that would be in Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And now over to Revelation 18, verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the, her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. So, I wanted to go ahead at this point and read a couple of other scriptures here. And, well, actually, I'm going to give you one other piece first. And then we'll go ahead and get in that. So I'm going to go into where the Bible has numerous references to the cup of God's wrath and how Babylon and other nations are going to drink from it. And that symbolizes, symbolizes divine punishments being inflicted. So this time we'll go through Revelation 4.10, 16, 19, and then I'm going to do Psalms 11, verse 6, and Isaiah 51, verse 17. So there's where our four scriptures come in. So in Revelation 14, 10, it says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And then Revelation 16, verse 19, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now back to Psalms 11, in verse 6, and it says, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, in a horrible tempest, this shall be the portion of their cup. So I think we're getting a feeling of what this word cup is about. And finally, in Isaiah 51, we'll read just verse 17. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which is drunk at the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury. You have drunken of the dregs of the cup and of the trembling and wrung them out. So, the drinking of this cup means accepting what is ever appointed to someone to experience. And it can be good or it can be bad. It can be joyful or it can be very sorrowful. All who drink of Babylon's cup will share in her future. Something to think about. So, Revelation... 14 and verse 10, using that example, speaks of drinking of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. So once again, drinking of the cup means that you are going to participate in whatever that cup pertains and contains. Now those... God is calling out of Babylon are asked to drink of another cup. <clears throat> the psalmist writes, I will take up the cup of salvation. That's in Psalm 116, verse 13. Now this cup has a far more positive ramification for us <clears throat> than the curses that are boiling in God's cup of indignation. The cup of salvation contains all the blessings of God, especially those of eternal life 
and reward in his kingdom. Matthew 26, verse 27. And he, Jesus, took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it, all of that cup. Mark 14, verse 23. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. They all drank of that one cup. Now, Jesus' final Passover service that he performed, he poured wine into his cup, and he blessed it, and he passed it around to his disciples. And each disciple took a sip from it. <clears throat> now, though nowadays we pour wine into separate vials or little cups, the principle is the same since the wine comes from one source all of it is blessed together, and all of it pictures the same thing, drinking from the cup of the lamb. Perhaps the meaning is more poignant, and it's easier to grasp by recalling Jesus' Passover service when the disciples literally, they literally took a sip from his cup. When we commemorate this in our Passover service, we are also drinking from the cup of Christ, blessed by our Savior. I have a question for you. Have we consciously rejected the cup of this world, of Babylon, in favor of the cup of the Lord? Brethren, God will not mix the contents of these two cups. They are totally incompatible. We must choose one or the other Paul says, we cannot drink of the Lord's cup and of the cup of demons. Find that in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21. So we must totally reject this world, this Babylon, and that awful cup of the false church, full of her abominations and of the blood of the saints, Revelation 18, verse 6. So if we lived in this world, and we all have to some degree, we've sipped from that awful cup, and it's been affected, we've been affected by its contents. So we have to now unconditionally reject it. We have to empty it, discard it, and replace it totally in favor of the new cup of the blessing from God. Again, notice Christ commands us to drink of his cup. Drink from it, all of you, Jesus says, Matthew 26, 27. He doesn't say drink the wine, but to drink of the cup. Okay, brethren, we know the red wine symbolizes the blood of Christ, and it was shed for the remission of sins, verse 28. We know we need to remember that it took the blood of the Son of God to forgive our sins, and we certainly rehearse that aspect of this service every year. We know that by drinking the wine, we accept his shed blood in our behalf, forgiving our sins, and it wipes our sinful slate clean. Thank God for that. But drinking of his cup adds so much to the meaning of the Passover wine. So let's go into this cup of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Now, Paul refers to this cup as the cup of blessing. He asks, is it not the communion, the fellowship, the sharing of the blood of Christ? Now, in the Jews' Passover meal, several cups are consumed. So let's notice what Vine's Expository Dictionary says under the article of cup. The cup of blessing in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 is so named from the third or the fourth, according to whoever you read, Edersheim says it's the fourth cup in the Jewish Passover feast, over which thanks and praise were given to God. So as we drink 
of the cup of the master, we should understand, brethren, that is a wonderful cup of blessing, thanksgiving, and praise that we offer to God as we drink it. Now, according to tradition, when a young Hebrew man and woman were to be betrothed, the groom poured wine into his cup and he invited the woman to drink of it. It was up to her. If she drank from it, she was considered betrothed to him. If she did not, no marriage was going to take place. Paul tells the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. When the bride drank of the cup, she drank of the marriage covenant or contract, accepting it. Understanding this symbolism, it's no wonder that Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 26, verse 28, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. As we drink of his cup, we accept his invitation to be betrothed to him. Have you considered that? To be forgiven of our sins so that we can be like he is, sinless, spotless, and without fault in his presence when at the marriage supper. We're working on it now, and we should be working on it with everything we have. And yet it means far more, brethren. Remember that drinking the cup meant to accept whatever that cup represented. When the mother of James and John approaches Jesus, remember she had a request to have her son sit on each side of Jesus when he came in his kingdom, and Christ replies with a question, Matthew 20, verse 22. Matthew 20 and verse 22, but Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. <clears throat> Are you, referring to James and John, able to drink of the cup that I am about to drink and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? So what did they say? They said, we are able. Now let's remember Matthew 26, 27, and he took of the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink you all of it, the cup. Brethren, they didn't take the cue from Jesus that they may have to drink way more than they cared to swallow. They answered affirmatively before they realized what Christ's cup contained. Jesus continues in James, or verse 23, excuse me, so I said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and you're gonna be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left hand's not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it's prepared by my father. And what happened to them? Well, James, the son of Zebedee, was the first apostle martyred early on by Herod. It'll be Acts 12, verse 2. And though John was the longest lived of the 12, apparently living near 100, nearly 100 years, he certainly suffered greatly at the hands of persecutors. Not only did he spend many years in exile on the Isle of Patmos, one tradition actually says that he miraculously survived being boiled in oil. Beyond this, he also had to watch the church disintegrate through apostasy and persecution. He had many trials. Now, part of what Jesus' cups entails 
is suffering. When we drink of his cup, we are saying we're willing to suffer with him and experience with him whatever he ordains for us. We symbolically pledge that we're willing to walk down the same path that he walked with similar consequences. I want you to think about that, brethren. Now, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane just a short while after urging his disciples to drink of his cup. And you know, he prayed fervently and emotionally to his Father in heaven. The symbol of that cup was fresh in his mind just as he had given his disciples a cup from which to drink, so had the Father placed a cup before him. Notice Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little farther and he fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now in the Old Testament, the cup is also a metaphor for the divine punishment of sin. So Jesus' death would involve far more than just physical torture and death. Christ would become the target of untold divine wrath as every sin that had been committed would be heaped on this one sinless being. He who had sought to always do the will of his father perfectly, he who had heard his loving father exclaim, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, who had now experienced his father's overflowing wrath for all sin, including all the worst sins. Some of what he suffered was for our sins, yours and mine. Now Jesus knew that death and incurring God's wrath for sin comprised the climax of his mission on earth as Messiah. But now, as that hour approached, his awareness of God's wrath against sin became even more intense the Bible explains this in detail, and you want to write this down. We do not have time to go through it today. But Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, through Romans chapter 3, verse 20. That goes into the detail. To Jesus, it was an unimaginable horror. Now, the second and third times he prayed in the garden, he changes his words slightly as he realizes he definitely has to drink that cup. Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Matthew 26, 42, and 44. So he now fully accepts the fact that the only way to get past this ordeal is to go through it. Let's notice John 18, in verse 1. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up your sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Now the cup is still on Jesus' mind, even after the soldiers from the high priest come to capture him. So when Peter tries to defend him, physically with a sword, and he misses Malchus' head, cutting off his ear instead, Jesus says to Peter, put up your sword, put it up in the sheath, shall I not drink of the cup which my Father has given me. Indeed, and shall we not drink of the cup which our King has given us? Indeed, if we want to be in the kingdom. Think about it. 
Now, it should be clear by now that we don't just drink the wine at Passover. We drink of the cup of Passover, meaning we're proclaiming our willingness to share in similar trials as Jesus did. We proclaim we're willing to endure whatever he has appointed for us as our lot. So we're also identifying ourselves with him exclusively, one on one. We are cupbearers to the King of Kings. And to him only. Psalm 16, five says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The eternal is our cup. Do we grasp the meaning of it? We cannot serve two masters. We know that. It's a commonly known scripture, Matthew 6, verse 24. We cannot simultaneously identify with Christ and Satan. Our lives, our actions, our words, our thoughts continuously announce which is our Father, God in heaven or Satan the devil. Drinking of Jesus' cup means to live his way of life and to renounce Satan's ways. The cup of salvation. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, I'll read that to you, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. Now there certainly is a bright side to all of this too. If we share in his shame, his suffering, we shall also share in his glory. If we struggle in the battle of overcoming with him, we shall certainly savour the victory by him. If we die with him and for him, we shall be resurrected in his likeness and in his image at the seventh trumpet of God. Psalm 116, 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So for us, the cup of the Lord is also that blessed cup of salvation. 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we endure... Our cup is also to reign with him. This is certainly, if we, it is certainly, I should say, it is certain, if we stay on the course. You know, I don't know if you realize, but God already sees us as having been saved, justified, and glorified. And if you want to read that and prove it to yourself, it's Romans 8, verse 30. He talks about the whole process. The only thing he leaves out is the sanctification. But he says that we're glorified. In his mind, it's already a done deal. They're not worried about it. They're not afraid they can't accomplish it. Do you know the only one that can mess it up is you and me. All you have to do is walk. And that's an easy thing for me to say, all you have to do. But we need to walk. The ancient Israelites needed to walk. The Apostle Paul continuously say, walk, walk, walk. We need to walk in the faith. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Now, 
Now once in his kingdom, our cup will be to reign with him forever and ever. That's Revelation 22, verse 5. Revelation 22, verse 5. And there shall be no night there, talking about in the kingdom, talking about when the Most High has returned. And they need no candle, or I should say the Most High has come to the earth, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. That's a promise, can't be broken. Our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's scriptural, Romans 8, verse 18. So first, the submission of the cup, then the glorification that follows. On that last evening, Jesus first introduces the cup of trial, suffering and overcoming. Then later asked his father to glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had before the world was. John 17, verse 5. Brethren, we tread upon that same narrow path. Now we're soon going to meet to eat and drink of this Passover, the symbols at the table God has set before us. What an honor to eat of the bread of life and to be his cupbearer and to drink of his cup. How important is it to ponder these things before the Passover? Paul advises us to examine ourselves, our mental state prior to taking of that cup. 1 Corinthians 11, 25 through 31. We should be careful not to eat the bread and to drink the cup in an unworthy manner. What do you mean an unworthy manner? What does that mean? Well, you know what it means? It means treating it as a common thing, taking it lightly, not being concerned, irreverently, lest we bring judgment and condemnation on ourselves. We're also to avoid the extreme reaction of some who after self-examination determine that they shouldn't drink of the cup at all. The Apostle Paul says clearly one should examine himself and so let him take of the bread and drink of the cup, verse 28. I'm going to repeat that. One should examine himself and, after you've examined yourself, see what's happening, see your shortcomings, understand what this Passover is about, then you go ahead and eat the bread and drink the cup. A Christian, for a Christian, it's vital to participate in this godly act with the proper attitude before the Most High. Now, Jesus said he would not drink of the fruit of the vine until he could drink it with us in his kingdom. That was Matthew 26, verse 29. And it won't be long now before we're going to witness with our own eyes our great Savior blessing his cup at a future at Passover, asking us to drink from it, all of you. And we will understand what a different kind of cup his is from the one that Babylon offers. We will soberly and thankfully lift the cup to our lips and drink of it. The cup of forgiveness, the cup of blessing, the cup of salvation, God really blesses when he blesses. 
going to finish up with Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6, and I doubt there's anyone here that is not familiar with that. Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6. When we really understand drinking of the cup, we can say with David, you prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. May God speed that day.